Thank you for um, coming. Thank you for coming so early in the morning. Um, uh, start with a slight apology. I have had a terrible throat all week, and when I woke up this morning, I was slightly worried that I was actually going to be able to speak. So I shall be medicating with lots of water, um, but please bear with me. <clears throat> um, other thing is, uh, so normally I do a, well, I mean, this is about the 10th year that I've done one of these workshops at the start of the day. Um, normally I do two hours, but those of you that were in um, Catherine's introductory speech just now, saying that they're compressing things, and so we've got 80 minutes. Uh, so I might be moving a little bit faster than I normally do. Uh, yeah, so a bit of an experiment, because this has got nothing to do with Perth. We're talking about tuning up your website and improving your Google juice. <clears throat> so it's, what we're talking about is about, it's all about making your website as attractive as possible to Google. Uh, and as I say, this is a completely pearl-free zone. If that's a problem, then now's a good time to, to leave. Um, and I'll just do a quick plug while we're waiting for a few more people to come in. So this is a brand new course. I've never done this before. You're saying it for the, for the first time. Um, and I've already um, agreed to run a longer version of it in Glasgow at um, the Pearl Conference in, in Glasgow next August. Um, so any feedback that you have about the course would be very welcome. And you can email me at Dave at onhacks.com. Thank you. So, most websites measure their success by the number of visitors that they get. Because you're probably, or you, you might be selling products or services, you might be trying to promote some kind of idea, you might just be raising awareness of um, a campaign or something like that. But in all cases, the number of eyeballs on your website equals success. And to a first level of approximation, the higher your Google rank ranking is, the more eyeballs you're gonna get on your site. <clears throat> I hope none of that is contentious in any way. So if Google thinks that your website is important or useful, then Google will show your site in more search re results, and that brings more visitors. So it's all about include, improving your Google juice. So what we've got over the next hour and a quarter or so, uh, some simple techniques to make your website more attractive to Google, to make it easier for Google to understand what your site is about. To make it easier for Google to understand the structure of your site. Anyone can use these techniques. Most people don't. That's why they work. Because you're just that little bit raising the bar against the people you're competing with. Okay, so what we're going to cover, uh, we'll talk about website structure, uh, the need for semantic HTML, looking at your URL structure, how you change a URL, using redirections, maybe a 410, putting structured data on your website, the use of sitemaps, um, open graph tags, link tags, robots.txt, response headers that um, can tell Google useful things, no follow attributes. I will look a bit about security, the importance of HTTPS and HSTS, which some of you might not have seen yet. Uh, JavaScript, does Google render JavaScript heavy, heavy websites? Spoiler, no. Um, Pre-rendering versus cloaking, we'll get into some of that a bit later on. Uh, mobile pages, mobile first index, responsive pages, accelerated mobile pages. Uh, and how to measure this stuff, looking at Google Webmaster Tools and Google Analytics. Uh, that's a lot of stuff to get through. What we're not going to cover is the other side of SEO, Oh, I said the word, but I wasn't going to say SEO. <laughs> uh, is uh, keyword research, analysis, content marketing. This is, all the, this is all the stuff about making sure that your site is covering the right topics and addressing the keywords that you want to cover. Um, that's the boring side. 
This, the side I'm going to talk about is the technical side about making sure that Google understands what it is that you've got on your site. Uh, the other stuff is making sure that what's on your site is what you want on your site. Okay? Any questions before we, we leap on in? Yes? Is, it, is there any search engine other than Google? <laughs> uh, I think I mentioned Bing and Yahoo, but honestly, in the UK, in, in Europe in general, the game is Google. Um, and to probably a first level of approximation, if you're getting things right for Google, it will work with the other engines as well. Okay. Right, so I'll start by looking a little bit about semantic HTML. Now this is an example of non-semantic HTML. I know it's early in the morning, so I thought I'd start with something that I'm sure you all understand anyway. Um, this is the horrible kind of HTML that I used to come across on sites that I worked with 20 years ago. I mean, we've got uh, the header is, is a font size, and they covered it in ref rather than red because that's a typo. Uh, change the font face, and, and there's nothing there, there's no, nothing implicit in the HTML about the, the the structure of this site. If we convert that to Semantic HTML, and obviously we, we turn that into a, an, an H1 tag, um, and all of the stuff about making it a particular size and changing the color and stuff like that, we um, stick all that in a style sheet. And, you know, I'm sure you will do that. Uh, ask Wikipedia. Wikipedia says semantic HTML is the use of HTML markup to reinforce the semantics or the meaning of the information in the web pages and web applications rather than to define its presentation and its look. <coughs> and this is something, <coughs> something that we're pretty used to as programmers, I guess, the idea about the separation of concerns and the reason why we all use the template talk, talk it or something like that to build our websites um, is we separate the business logic from the display logic, and here we're just we're, um, separating the meaning of the parts of our website from the way that we want them to actually look. Uh, which, among, uh, 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 among other things, means that it's easier to change the look when we want to do that in two years' time. <clears throat> so we use HTML to mark up the content of the page, and we use CSS to control the presentation of that content. So what do I mean by semantic markup? Well, I mean markup that describes the structure of the content. So headers, paragraphs, lists, that kind of, of thing. Heading, you know, different heading levels, make sure you've got heading, make, make sure that you have an H1 at the top of your page, the most important heading in your page, and then H2s and H3s. I, I once um, <coughs> I once worked on a project where the, the um, front end des des designer knew he had a, he wanted an H1 on the top of his page, but, the, but all the other headings on the page were H4s because that was the size that he wanted. Um, CSS was around; he just hadn't heard of it. Um, you can use div class and, and span class to to add um, elements into your HTML that there aren't actually HTML tags for. Um, and we'll also be looking a little bit more into structured data a bit um, later on, which is sort of taking this um, idea a bit further. All right, non-semantic markup, the kind of markup that you shouldn't be having in your HTML these days is, the, is, is markup that is purely there to describe presentation. Um, font, center, who remembers the blink tag? Uh, some presentation attributes, background, a line, no wrap, that kind of, of, of thing. If they're, if, if they're in your HTML, you're doing it wrong. Because that can all be handled in CSS these days. A um, couple of things that aren't quite so um, clear cut. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you still use I in your, um, in your HTML. I means make this an italic um, phrase, whereas there's the, the EM. Um, tag which means emphasize this and then in your CSS you can say well 
emphasise should be in Italian. Uh, and similarly, similarly, um, B for bold versus strong. Yes. What about the use of icon fonts in Italian? Oh, sorry. What about the use of icon fonts with the Italian, which is popular right now? Icon fonts. Icon fonts, where you can have like a font that looks like icons and uh, put a class on an iTag and it converts into a emoticon or something, but it's actually a font. Okay, um, but the definition of the font you're using would be in the CSS, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's true, but it's an iTag. But there's nothing, there's no text in it, it's just like a blank tag. And then there's like a content before that puts basically a character there. But I guess if it's, the, if it's the best way to do it, then yeah. Probably. Uh, also, I mean, HTML5 is not really new and shiny any, anymore. It's been around for a very long time. Um, but it has it really got into the semantic elements and it's, it, it's added some, some new things that you might not have seen. You can now define a main section on your web page. You can define a section, an article, a header, um, and things that you have on many web pages. You can have a footer, you can have a side, you can have a navigation bar. You can have a, a figure. You can use all of these. Actually, you can have a uh, yeah. You can have a figure. Um, you can you can add all of these into your HTML, and it helps the Google bot to to understand what your the, what the, the structure is of your pages. We've come a, a long way since we had to put font tags in your, in our HTML pages. Uh, well worth investigating these and making use of them. Uh, moving on, I said I've got, I haven't got very long. URL structure. You need to think about your URL structure, how you're presenting the URLs on your site to your users. They need to mirror the, the, the structure of, of your site. A good URL is three things. It's meaningful. It's hackable. And it's permanent. What's a meaningful U U URL? Well, which is the more meaningful URL? Um, the path that looks like this, 2017-10-LBW's awesome, or that, which is, if you were writing, if you were, if you were, if you were setting up a WordPress blog, um, then the, the um, default URL that WordPress gives you would be something that looks like this. I think it's obvious which is the more meaningful here. <clears throat> People tell me that users don't care about URLs, and I think that's partly true. I mean, when you um, you try to talk to your um, friends and family that perhaps aren't quite so technical, um, sometimes the idea of a location bar in a browser is um, rather lost on them. And they, they find pages by Googling for them and clicking on links. So I've, I've seen people who, who you, you email them a link and they cut the link and paste it into Google search, hoping that the actual link will be the first result that comes back from Google. Um, but even if the users don't care about the URL, Google does care. Google uses your URLs as, part of a, as, as one method to understand what's going on on your site. So some tips to make your URLs meaningful. <clears throat> Use titles, not IDs, like we saw in the, um, in the previous slide. Use a dash rather than an underscore to separate words. Google seems to recognize that as more of a separator for, for words. Um, minimize the parameters that you pass, you know, the foo equals bar and x equals y. Uh, avoid session information. Now it really annoys me <coughs> when people share Amazon links because Amazon links stuff you all this um, MD5 crap at the end of the of the, of the link. Uh, and I, I guess Amazon gets a, away with it because of Amazon. But if a if a new site started up and, and, and had all that crap in the URLs, they wouldn't get very 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 far. Store that in a cookie. Um, avoid tech-specific 
URLs. Don't have a URL that has .html at the end of the of, the, of, of it or um, dot, dot .cgi or dot .pl. Um, firstly, it's information that your users don't need. It just serves to obfuscate the um, location. Um, secondly, uh, it gives hackers too much information about your site. Um, and thirdly, if you've got dot, dot .asp, it just means people will laugh at you. Um, mod rewrite or the equivalent in your web server is a good way to um, take to, to create clean URLs and to have them converted to what you actually need, which might be messier under the hood. Hide it from, from the users. <coughs> hackable URL. What do I mean about hackable URL? I mean, I mean hackable in, a, in, the, in the good way. So, again, users don't care about the URLs, but some do. I mean, probably most of the people in this room um, understand what a URL is and, and what it means. Um, and so they will, if you, if you give them a URL that appears in the location bar, they will then edit it in, in the location bar to try and find other parts of your site. So let them do that. Ensure that the pages that they might find actually return something useful. So if you go back to this URL we, 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 we talked about earlier, now that's obviously, I assume, a link to a news story or an article on a, a website. But what happens if you take this bit off and just go to News 2010? You want to get a list, perhaps just um, titles and, and a summary of all the stories published in October of this year. If you go to slash 2017, probably a paginated version of all the stories um, published in, in that year. And, and similarly for slash news. An overview of your of of the news section of your site. Make sure that those pages that people will get to by hacking um, the URL. Make sure they exist and return useful content. It's probably the basis for a breadcrumb structure. <coughs> Permanent URLs, the, the, the third thing that a URL should be. Cool, you, 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 URLs don't, don't change. Yeah, sometimes they have to. Um, but if they do and you end up serving a, a, a 404 to Google, then that's bad, 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 bad news. Google doesn't like 404s. So we use redirections, and we'll cover redirections a bit, in a bit more detail later on. <clears throat> sometimes URLs go away. Sometimes you've, you've had something on your site and now there's just no need for it to be on your site anymore. And HTTP has a response code, 410, which means gone away. Don't come looking for it any, anymore. If, you, if something really is genuinely gone from your site, return a 410 and Google will say, the first time Google finds it, will say, oh, 410, right. Knock that off the index, don't even think about it ever again. So, yeah, let me just lubricate and then we'll talk about redirection, redirection URLs. How are we doing so far? Making sense? Mm -hmm. Stuff you all already knew? Oh, there's a few. Okay, that's good. 30 days. Redirecting URLs. <clears throat> so, sometimes URLs have to change. I always should, you should always ask yourself whether the change is absolutely <coughs> essential. All too often, um, I've seen people um, changing URLs because they've switched to as management have bought a new CMS and it controls what the URLs of the output need to 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 be. Does, it, does anybody here um, active in the web world? I guess 15, 20 years ago, when all it seemed that all of the newspaper websites in the UK, just so they were they, they were just starting up, 
They all bought a product called Story Server, which was a, a um, tickle based uh, CMS. Oh, I swear, it was too early to call it a CMS, but the um, URLs all just had these index numbers in them, and there was two index numbers separated by a comma for reasons that nobody really ever understood. And of course now they've changed and they have um, meaningful URLs. And I'm talking about the, the, the Guardians where I had um, most experience of that. And of course if you're moving from a, a, a really rubbish URL scheme to an, they, 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 they now, now have an in-house CMS <coughs> And it does everything that they want. So obviously that's a good improvement, but I've seen people go the other way. And they've, and they've got all these URLs out there in the Google index or in um, people's bookmarks, and they implement this new C CMS, and they um, all, all the URLs change, and they do nothing about it, and suddenly their Google juice just falls off a, a cliff. I've had my blog now for 15 years, I think, and it's been movable type, and it's been WordPress, and it's been different versions of all of those things, and you should see my .ht access file that's got all the redirection rules in it to make sure that if, you, that if you'd got a link to my first ever blog post from 15 years ago when it was published in... Um, movable type on one of those rubbish style URLs with just an, an ID in it, it still works. It will redirect you to the right place on the WordPress site. So yes, you need to return a 301. That's the, that's the, um, the number that, that, that you need. Um, that is a permanent redirection. Um, and the thing is, it will also transfer the Google juice, the Google rank. Google goes to your website, to the old address it's looking for, it finds the, the 301 and says, okay, so if anybody, if I'm an, anywhere in the index where I was storing any information about that old page, I'll replace it with this new page. And this new page has all of the Google juice that, that, that the old page had. Um, worth knowing that actually browsers cache this redirection. That's what it's, it's called a permanent re redirection. Your, if, if your browser goes to the old page, it gets the 301 back with the location of where to go, and it will um, cache the address. So the next time you try to go to the old address, your browser will say, nope, we don't need to go there. I've got this better, up this, this updated address. The problem with this is that they, well, it's not a problem. I mean, it's good. It's, it's, it's all good most of the time. The browsers cache that permanently. And there is no way to undo that cache. That cache. If you all of the cache con, con, con control stuff you've got in your browser, there's nothing to remove 301 um, re, 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 redirection caches. So if you get it wrong, it can be tricky to fix that. And like I say, sometimes you need to remove a URL. I mean, it goes away for a, a good reason. Perhaps you were running a promotion. Uh, and, and, and you had a special site for the promotion, and that promotion is now over. But don't let it just 404. Redirect it somewhere useful. Find somewhere else on your site that people that were visiting that page might find useful. Or, at the very least, redirect it to the, to the home page. Or, you know, in some cases, maybe the 410 that I, that I mentioned earlier. And then if it's before 10, Google will take it out from the index. But you need to stay on top of your redirections. So we remove a, a page that we had at slash foo, and we redirect it to slash bar. That's fine. Time passes. And later on, we remove bar and redirect it to slash. Now, if somebody comes looking for foo, they get redirected twice, and that slows them down. So these kinds of redirection chains are a bad idea. You need to keep them as short as possible. Um, so you need to, when, when you do this redirection, 
you need to actually update this redirection at, at the same time. But that's a whole can of worms. Maintaining your, your redirection change is um, a nightmare. As I said, just, if you want to have a look at my dot HT access at some point, you can see how, how bad it, it can get. <coughs> right. Uh, any questions? We've been there for about half an hour. I was wondering if that 410 trick could help to, to solve the, the sticky 301 that you were getting rid of. So, uh, an uh, erroneous 301. And then force Google to re index the right page. Maybe. I haven't tried it. Just a thought. You mentioned the two things. I yeah. Mean, one seems to possibly help solve the other. Uh, interesting. I'm, I'll give it a try. I'll re 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 report back in Glasgow. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, you mentioned that browsers um, cache the permanent redirection. Yes, that's why they're called permanent. 301? Yeah. Uh, what about 302s? Uh, 302 is a temporary re 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 redirection. It, it, it means this time go here instead, but next time try looking in the, in the, in the original slot because it might be back. Yeah. Although actually, <clears throat> um, I recommend, well, if you're having trouble sleeping, I recommend having a look at the Wikipedia page about HTTP ret ret return codes because there was some confusion about how early browsers read out, uh, actually implemented some of the, of, of the return codes. So they've now actually had to expand it, and there's now uh, 302, 305, 307. That all do subtly different things because some of them work how they were supposed to work and some of them needed to be updated. Um, but 301 is generally what you want. Uh, structured data. <clears throat> so Google needs to parse your content in order to understand it. That's what you know, Google wants to do. Google wants to understand what, what your website is about. So we need to make it as easy as possible for Google. So what we can do is we can include structured versions of your data actually in the HTML page. Because Google is building this thing called the Google Knowledge Graph, where it, tell, it, it, it just knows everything and it can, tell, it can answer any question. When SEO, there's that term again, first started, the, the, everyone's aim was to get to position one in the search re 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 results. But now we have a, a, a higher goal, a lower goal, I suppose. We now want to get to position zero. Has anyone heard of position zero? No? no. Is it short of the uh, advertised results? Not the advertised results, a bit above the advertised right, results. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit above the advertised yeah. results. Yeah. So, so it's a piece of information. Yes, if, if, if Google thinks it can answer your question without actually showing you a, a website, it will give you the information on the results page in an answer box. And this is position zero. So you've Googled for Tower Bridge lift times, and Google said, actually, I, 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 I know what the Tower Bridge lift, lift times are. Here they are. <clears throat> Bit of a double-edged sword, because... Um, for the user, it's great because they've got the, all the information that they want. Um, but for the um, website owner that desperately wants the users to click through Google's results to get to their website so they view the adverts that are on their website so they get paid, uh, not so good. Um, those of you that have been following stuff I've been doing this year might realize that this is something that is um, quite close to my heart because I wrote a um, I, I, I now work quite close to Tower Bridge, and I couldn't find an easy way to get to get my phone to buzz when Tower Bridge was going to go up. Um, so I scraped the, the data from the Tower Bridge website and created a website that has an RSS feed, a JSON feed, a, an iCal feed of all that information. <clears throat> and I'm desperately trying to get Google to suck that information from my site because it's all there and it's all easy for Google but no, it's still, you, you may not be able to see it but it's still sucking it from the, um, the out of date table that's on the official Tower, Tower Bridge website. So, so this is what position zero is all about. 
So there's a couple of ways that we can put structured data into our website. There's a thing called microdata, which is a an extension of. Does anyone ever dabble with micro formats? Yeah, well, you'll recognise some of this kind of stuff. So we're just extending the HTML, putting some apps and other um, attributes and um, tags in the HTML. Or there's JSON LD, and LD stands for linked data, and that's a separate script tag that um, sits in the header of your web page. Uh, we'll look at microdata first. So we're using some extensions to HTML markup. There's new attributes called item scope, item type, item name. And it looks something like this. So um, this is a bit of markup for a film. A conversation with Pub yesterday with a colleague. We were talking about the best films that we'd seen. He claimed Avatar, and I just stopped the conversation. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically we're saying um, we've got a div here. So it, it, it makes heavy uses of, 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 of divs and spans. And, um, we're saying this is a, an item of type movie, which is defined on this website. Um, and the name of the movie is the text in, in, in this tag. The director is a new type of item, so we'll put an item to <coughs> attribute there. And it's an item of type person, and then we've got information about the person. The name, birth date, uh, and note, oh, you can also note that because um, we want to display the birth date in a in, in this format for the user, we can override it in the structured data by giving the date time attribute here and gives it and, and give it in a, a standardised format. Um, and that's not particularly difficult. To, to, to do, Google has a structured data testing tool, so you can make changes to your web page and then um, ask Google to have a, a look at it and it will tell you what structured data it's found on your website. Uh, the other way of doing it, and the way that actually I prefer doing it, is in um, JSON LD. So this is a, I quite like it because it's actually separate from the data um, table, the actual listing of the data on the page. Uh, you embed it within a, a script tag. Um, it's worth noting <coughs> at the moment, Google doesn't like it to be a separate file, I know, because I've tried. Um, so it needs to be um, a script tag, and the contents of the script tag actually need to be embedded in the page. You can't do scripts and have source equals and then an external file. Um, but that looks like this. And it's, yeah, you, you all know what JSON looks like. It's just JSON with a specific vocabulary of um, uh, uh, tags. And it's the same information that we saw on the microdata version, but just in a, in a, in a different format. Any questions on any of that? <clears throat> Um, there's, there's lots of, of these the data types. Like these, we, we, on, on those examples, we saw movie, we saw person. Um, but if you go to schema.org, which is where this stuff is defined, there's loads of it. So this is a joint project. As I said, I said I'd mention other search engines. Here you go. Google being Yahoo working together to define these structures. And there's dozens of, 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 of data types there. And it gives really good examples of usage. Um, things that you can just cut and paste if, for example, you're writing slides for a talk. Oh, uh, yeah, so I've that all. Um, so here you've got events, you've got medical entities, creative works, books, movies, music recordings, recipes, TV series. Organizations, person, place, product offers, reviews, action, it goes on. There are literally dozens of these um, types. So it's hard to believe that there's not something on your web page that you can't turn into structured data and tell Google oh, about it. Aim for positions zero. Stop people visiting your website. 
or, or something like that. <coughs> now, moving on to open graph. Has anyone tried implementing open graph on their website and got it wrong? <laughs> <laughs> they solved it up for me. The open graph is, a, is a, a special type of um, structured data. It's used when people share sites on social media. It's uh, metadata tags that sit in the in the head of your page. <laughs> Have you ever gone to share a link on Facebook and the image has just been some random sponsor's logo from further down the, the page, for example. Or you've seen somebody has shared something on Facebook and the, the um, image that is next to it is nothing at all to do with the headline of the story. That's because people haven't implemented um, open graph tags. So it, it gives you control over how your link appears. <clears throat> And you can in include the image and say, this is the image that should appear for this story. And stops random in images appearing. Uh, I fixed it for two com com conferences in, in, in the last month. This conference was doing it wrong as well, as well as last conference. So I'm an expert now. Pay me to do it for, for you. Maybe just again, there is the Facebook linter, which you can use for any document. It will check whether your open graph data are correct or not, so you get a preview of whatever you do. It's a pretty cool tool. Yeah, but if people don't even know what open graph is, then yeah. they, don't, they, they don't know to, to try that kind of thing. It's called Facebook Linter, and it will even tell you what's wrong with your site, so which tag is missing, or what's wrong with the resource. Giving away all our secrets. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> That's okay. So, I mean, this is an example of the kind of thing that you that, that, that you'll see. So you, you've got these OG tags: meta property equals something, content equals something else. So you've got the title, and so that would say London Pearl Conference, London Pearl Workshop, uh, a name to go there, <laughs> what type it is, whether it's an article or a website or a, a few other things, um, the URL to click for the link. Here we've got two images, so you, people can choose. That'll give them two images to choose from, but two images that we've chosen to allow them to choose from, rather than all the sponsors that goes up on the page. Uh, and then the description, and this is this would be the text that would appear under the, the title when the um, when it's shared. So it's actually not difficult to get right, <coughs> but people don't know about it, which is why so many pages get it get it wrong. And then there's Twitter cards. Uh, Open Graph is a Facebook invention, hence the Facebook Mint tool. Um, Twitter cards are supposed to be able to use the Open Graph tags to, um, to do the same thing. Uh, but in my experience, they do sometimes, and they do for some of them, but in other cases, it doesn't work. And so there are a few Twitter specific tags that you should add. As well, um, Twitter card. You would take what well, the type of card is. It's, a, it's normally a summary, and for some reason, it, they they don't often recognise the Facebook Open Graph image tag. So you put your own Twitter image in as well, um, and that's basically the set of tags that I've used for both this conference and for the Glasgow conference next year. And they all and they both seem to be working quite happily. Now, that, to be honest, doesn't help you with Google, but it helps you share things, and by having your stuff shared, and Google likes it more anyway, so it, it all kind of helps. Morning, <clears throat> Pavel. Sorry. <laughs> Sitemaps. So a sitemap is an XML file that just contains a list of all the pages that you want Google to know about. And so it's an easy way to submit a load of pages to Google. Uh, you've got a CMS, it's almost certainly going to be 
generating it for, for, for you, but it's worth having a look and seeing what you've got and what it contains. Uh, you can publish the location in your robots.txt, and we'll look at robots.txt in a bit more detail later on. But basically, you put a line in it, that should all be on one line, sitemap, and then just a, a link to your XML file. <laughs> so here's an example of sitemap. Um, other than sh just showing Google where the pages are, there are a few interesting um, extra things. So basically you've got the main tag is the URL set tag, and then within that you've got URL tags. You've got the location, which is actually where you want Google to go, when it was last modified, how often approximately you think it um, is updated, and um, a priority, which is a number between zero and one, which is how important, in your opinion, that page is. And these last three, um, Google can use as hints to work out the most efficient crawling algorithm for your site. If, um, if you've got a page that has a priority of 0.2 and you say it changes annually, and it last changed yesterday, then there's really no point in Google coming back to have a look at it for several months. So by making your site, um, giving Google the information that makes your site friendly, let's say Google can know how frequently to crawl certain pages of your site. That makes Google lucky like more. That's what it's all about. Is there a danger though of doing something the same year and then updating it a week later because you forgot something and then it not going back for another year? There's a slight danger, yeah. You can override it by, by saying crawl this page now. And we'll, we'll do that in the Google Webmaster Tools, which we'll look at later. <coughs> so, yeah, within the site map element, we've got the URL element, which has location, last mod, change frequency, and priority. Which the Google crawler uses as hints. And you can only have 50,000 URLs um, in a sitemap file, which might not seem a problem to some of you. Um, but I'm working for Zoopla at the moment, and we have a lot of pages. And a sitemap file can't be bigger than 50 megabytes. But you can have as many sitemap files as you like. And you can list the sitemap files in a sitemap index, which looks like this, sitemap index, and then just a list of the sitemaps. And they only have last, last modification. Um, moving swiftly on. You can have, these are tags that sit in your header. Um, link red equals something, href equals something else. Specifically, we've done, it's, it, these um, show links to pages that have some kind of relationship with, with the current page. They are HTML elements that sit in the head section. Uh, we're going to look at the canonical tag, and we're going to look at the um, preve and next Tags. So we'll start with the canonical tag. Basically, it's saying if you've got two URLs that point to the same content, there's two different ways of coming to the same page. Um, Google doesn't like duplicate content. Google, if, if Google sees the same content on two different URLs, <clears throat> then it thinks you're trying to game the system. It thinks you're being nasty and it will penalize you. So you put a canonical tag in saying, I know that people might come at this from a couple of different angles, but actually there's one canonical way of looking at this page, and that is this URL. And if you put the same canonical tag pointing to the canonical version in both of the duplicate pages, then Google knows they're only actually the two different views of the same page. Tells it Google which URL is definitive. 
Uh, why might you do? Well, you might have request parameters that come in different orders, perhaps, and they both end up with the same view of the page. Uh, Imagination parameters, searches, that kind of thing. Um, something that we've done recently at Zoopler is we switched protocols. We switched from HTTP to HTTPS on all, on all pages. And so for a while, people were coming to um, the site from two different pro pro protocols. Um, more rarely, you might switch your, your domain. Um, yeah, so what does it actually mean? It says, don't ever return the non-canonical version in search queries. But it also passes the page rank from the non-canonical version onto the canonical version. And therefore, it minimizes um, duplicate content errors. Uh, in many cases, redirects are actually better. If you switch, certainly, um, what we did when we switched our protocols is we had, we had a 301 in place. Uh, that's somewhere where the, um, <clears throat> the browser's caching the 301 um, is a bit scary because you've got this um, multi-million dollar website and you're redirecting everything from HTTP to HTTPS. You better be sure that you're right. Yeah, often it's worth considering a bye -bye. 301 in, pre in preference to a canonical link. Next and previous tags, uh, which link to other pages in a sequence. So if you've got um, the, your news from, from November and you're on page two, you might have a link rel going to page one and a link prev going to page three. Obvious stuff. Uh, but Google then recognizes the sequence. Um, browsers could do something clever. But they don't. In fact, they, they, they did. I, 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 was, and I <clears throat> haven't had the time to do the research properly, but I'm sure there was one browser that, 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 that used to recognize next and pre links in pages and would give you extra arrows on the, the toolbar. Maybe it was Galleon or something obscure like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something else that the browser could do. Do you know that a browser does it? Yeah, so it's easy to search results. I don't think it's a dirty trick, I think it's a good trick. It's always good. Yeah. Just these days, don't do very much with those tags at all. <clears throat> um, robots.txt. You should have a robots.txt. The robots exclusion standard. This is about controlling the way that um, crawlers crawl your, your site. You can ban crawlers from certain areas or there is other, or you actually can contain other. It's it's it. Robots.txt started off as a way to ban crawlers from various parts of your site, but now it contains lots of other information. Um, some of these extensions are non-standard, so they don't have the same effect across the board, which is sad. Um, so yeah, they all live in a in a file called robots.txt, which sits in the root of your website. And it might, so the, the, the first things to just control how crawlers work, it all makes, it all looks pretty obvious, I guess. So if the user agent is the Google bot, don't allow it to um, call anything in the slash private directory. If the Google bot is the Google bot news, you've got a directory called no news here, and obviously you don't want the Google bot looking in that directory. You can use a star for the, um, Googlebot, which means everything, and then so no, none of the um, crawlers will browse, will crawl that directory. 
These are all advisory. Um, there's nothing that stops a crawler crawling these directories. Um, but there's, 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 there's certainly no evidence that the big crawlers break these rules. Question, do, do the crawlers, the big ones, uh, focus on HTML content primarily, or do they also look at PDFs and other file formats? Um, as time passes, they, they get more and more interested in, in crawling more and more of those kinds of things. I think most of them now, PDFs are easy. P PDFs are just run of the mill. Um, some of them are now working on um, audio and video and all sorts of other types. Of. Um, as an extension to the disallow um, di 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 Directive. There's an allow directive which says so we, we're disallowing stuff and private stuff. Allow private stuff except this. You're doing it wrong if your structure looks like this. There are better ways to structure your 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 website, and and, the, and you're starting to get into situations where the order of these directives means something. So I wouldn't recommend. And so the default robots.txt, if you don't have a robots.txt, then the crawlers assume it looks like this, which is all user agents disallow nothing. You know, it gives them free reign to crawl whatever you like on your site. <clears throat> but I'd, I'd, I'd recommend um, just putting, if, if you're not going to have a, if you, if, if, if you don't have a need for a robots.txt, I recommend just putting a robots.txt that contains that in the root directory, if only because it stops you getting 404s when the crawlers come looking for and they all ask for your robots.txt and it's not there, you get a 404 in the PDF. <coughs> Another thing you can put in there is um, a crawl script and delay which tells crawlers to stop at the visit. I think it might even vary what it means between cool bots, which is suboptimal. So I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, and as I said, you can put your sitemaps in here. Uh, and you can also have your sitemap indexes, and they're, and they're called sitemaps. Just like that. So stick your sitemaps in your the, robot. Twenty pass for finishing. Uh, and so these give you final control over indexes. Uh, they can be done either as meta tags in the header or as um, default headers. Normally speaking, as meta tags. And look about this meta name equals robots. Content equals something, or an X robots tag in the tag the content is. So it's index, so do you want this page to be indexed? Uh, content equals index, saying that's the, the default the browsers assume they can index every page of your site. Or you can say no index. stop them from indexing any content on that page. And as um, response pages may look like that. You can follow that page index. And the other one is follow. So index is controls whether they whether the, the crawler actually looks at the content on the page and stores the information that it finds in the search engine index. Follow um, controls whether the crawler looks at the links on your page and then follows those links to find further content. And sometimes you might have pages where you just want the Google to go no further. And that's follow or no follow. And you follow the 
again is to follow and on the page. And is it the Bible? You don't need to have the Hebrew tag, you can say index, no follow. So you just follow it. It's a combination you want. A more um, specific version of this that gives you even finer controls is you can turn off no, you can put no follow on specific attributes or specific links. It's an attribute that appears on the A tag, the links tag, is ready for no follow. It looks like that. And as it says, don't follow this link, don't um, take any notice of this link at all, this, as far as you, as far as you're concerned, this link is dead. And it doesn't pass at the end. One of the things that Google does is um, it, it uses pages that you link to. If you, if, if, if you have a, a page with a high page rank and you link to other pages, then a proportion of your page rank gets passed on to the pages that you link to. And then other um, things being no follow. Says don't pass on any page rank. Um, I'm, I'm telling people about this page. I'm not necessarily saying that it's a good page. <clears throat> Does anyone know where this first came from? This idea? Uh, no, I think I saw it before I, I went to Wikipedia. It was links in blog posts. It was, you know, well, if you, if you, if you, if you have. A site that takes any kind of comments or any kind of user generated content, um, you will get bots posting comments on your page containing links to their page because they're assuming that just the existence of links on your page will pass page rank back to, the, to, to their website. Um, and a no follow, <coughs> it cuts off the, the bleeding of that page rank. And so <clears throat> most blog engines, WordPress, for example, these days will default to putting no follow on any links that appear in comments on your blog. Doesn't stop spam commenting. <clears throat> right. Ten minutes or so. Moving on to security. <clears throat> so, Google announced probably a couple of years ago that it's actually giving a um, a ranking boost to secure pages, uh, by which it means pages that are served over HTTPS. Do you care? Uh, they should. Uh, I, a couple of years ago, <coughs> I was at the Open Tech conference, which is a sort of um, civil tech conference, and I saw a um, you know, you get a green padlock when you're on a secure site and, and the certificates all match up. This, this, um, I think this woman has worked, has worked for a government department and they've done some research into um, what, how much users actually understood about secure websites and whether they were on a secure website or not. And it turned out they've kind of half taken on this idea of padlocks being a good thing. And you show them any website with a picture of a padlock on, and they assume it's a secure website. We know better. But another, another thing that you'll see more and more these, these days is newer versions of Chrome and Firefox and other browsers now warn users that they're about to submit a form across a link that is insecure. A lot of mobile browsers. I haven't seen that, but maybe I'm like just surfing the better part of the internet. <laughs> but yeah, but, uh, users will become more and more aware of this over the next couple of years. If you, if you haven't been worried about secure 
top five up until now, you should be. So, yeah, the question. Yeah. Good point. Question about the uh, ranking for SSL. When you get a certificate, can we do domain validation or, I think, entity validation, which are two different mm -hmm. types? Um, do you have any insights whether Google is ranking the entity validation over the domain? No, I, I, I think at the moment, <coughs> Google is just, is the, is, is this being served over HTTPS? And that's good enough for Google. And I'm not saying, you know, and I know that there are good reasons for wanting to, um, to push the entity validation version higher, but I don't believe there's any evidence that they're doing so yet. I wouldn't be at all surprised if it happens in five years. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I run dot.co.org and that's currently running on, on, on HTTP. Um, we haven't done anything to change that because there's a project that means that there's a brand new shiny version of blogs.co.uk um, just, just around the corner, but it's been just around the corner for five years. So maybe we should, because I noticed that people are now, I've had a couple of, of, of bug reports from people saying that they're trying to um, post comments and it's got, and they've, got, they've got this browser one because it's, it's on a uh, insecure. You know. Oh yes, HTTPS. So you need to get an HTTPS certificate, um, but that's complicated and that's expensive. But there's this organization out there called Let's en Encrypt, um, and they will give you um, not, um, a very high level so, so, so certificate. It's only the main page, it's not entity based. Um, but it's free, and it's good enough to, to pass the browser checks. Um, and <coughs> if you're, if you're, um, Hosting websites on a some kind of hosting provider, the company that I use uses a thing called Plesk, and it has a plugin for Let's Encrypt. I just click the domain, press a button, and suddenly it all works. And it does all the redirections and everything else. Lovely. Yeah. And start computer What? Start domain, so you can have changes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, as I say, if you're not thinking about HTTPS, you should be. Um, and so, I mean, again, this is something that we did in Bootbird. I've spent a lot of this year moving up three websites from HTTP to HTTPS. Um, mixed content, when you're, when, you're, when you're serving a page over HTTPS, all of the resources on that page need to be served to HTTPS. Um, so, images, JavaScript, style sheets, they all need to come from... Um, HTTPS. Um, so uh, that's that's fine if it's resources that you're hosting on your site and your domain, but there can be a problem if you're linking to stuff elsewhere. You need to find whether there's a few versions of it available. Can you bring them in, host them locally? We had a huge problem because we didn't, <coughs> some of our estate agents were using a third party um, uh, video hosting. Thing that didn't support HTTPS, but luckily Zupra is big enough to be able to bully them into changing it and supporting HTTPS. Um, can you use a protocol less? Um, you, you are, you are, which looks like this, it doesn't have HTTPS at the start, and then um, it will use whichever protocol the page is being served on. Um, presumably, when you're going through all this work, you put in a redirection, a redirect from your HTTP site to your HTTPS site. But Google has um, indexed your entire HTTP site. Users have bookmarked your own HTTP um, links. So people will, people will be hitting the HTTP site and being redirected all the time, for weeks. Other sites will have links to Pages on your website. There's a lot of redirection going on. And there's a thing called HSTS. Have anyone heard of HSTS? Yes. 
surprised at me, I have. It's sound for HTTP straight pipe for security. Um, so it's a uh, meta abbreviation. Basically, it's an, H it's an HTTP header. It's just like this. Um, and what it basically says is your browser makes a request, gets this header back, and the header says to the browser, <coughs> next time you try to go to this domain, don't bother looking at the HTTP version because I'm only going to read anything from the HTTPS version. So you only make requests to the HTTPS version. So again, you better be sure that your HTTPS version works before you implement this. Because uh, this information again is cached in the browser and it's difficult to undo. So there's this another thing. So we still need to make that first request to the HTTP site to get the redirect and the header back, which then caches the um, information in the browser. So browsers are implementing a preload list, so you can uh, ask for your your domain to be included in their preload list, which means never even bother making that first request to HTTP. Always just go to the secure version. information about that at this address. I'm going to move quite quickly because I've still got time to do it. I've only got less than 10 minutes. Um, my slides will obviously be available um, elsewhere at the end of the day or tomorrow when I've left it. <coughs> so I don't feel you have to make notes of all these things. Uh, JavaScript. I, I, I mean, this is a silly example, but people might web, write websites that look like this. This fires up and slurges all the lovely content into this div. You've, also, you've seen sites that look like that, right? Not just me. And people say that that's fine because Google renders JavaScript pages. Oh, it kind of does. But it does it slowly. And when I say slowly, I mean like weeks later, it might have rendered your site. And it's buggy. Um, it uses Chrome 41, or it uses the rendering engine in Chrome 41 to do it. Um, and it depends on your, on your framework. Other frameworks, um, various JavaScript frameworks get um, rendered better by Google than others. And the one that's worse is Angular, <laughs> uh, which is made by Google. So, some JavaScript suggestions. Don't make JavaScript essential. Don't write that app on the, on the first page. Serve so useful HTML content and then use progressive enhancement to, to make it work better for people that have JavaScript. Test the site with JavaScript disabled. You know, that first site, if you tested that with JavaScript disabled, nothing would have worked. Or you can pre render your site. Um, I did some work with something recently that tried this and it didn't have great results, so I hesitate. Um, but basically, you use something called something like Phantom JS, which is a command line um, JavaScript tool, to prepare pre rendered versions of all of your pages. And when the search engine bot comes knocking, you serve that rather than your flashy JavaScript version. It's, it is hard to get, get it right. Um, there's a site called PreRender.io that would help you if you, if you, if you wanted to go down that, that route. Um, but there's, there's also this issue which Google says, you know, one of the things that Google is really hot on is you must serve the Googlebot the same content as you serve your end users. And if you're serving a pre-rendered version of the content, just because Google's shit at um, rendering in your JavaScript, is that taking who knows? I wouldn't take the risk myself. Uh, mobile pages. Mobile first index of 20 pages, accelerated mobile pages. Uh, 
people for about two years now. Most Google searches are on mobile devices. So like sixty percent of, of, of searches that Google do come from mobile devices. So Google is starting to prioritise mobile sites. So now, what, what this effectively means, and this is going to be big in the first quarter of next year, they are starting to crawl your mobile site first. And they are boosting sites that have good mobile versions. Well, they will. A full implementation soon. Google will never tell you when they're going to do things. Um, but they are making noises about it. They make us think it's going to take off in the first quarter of 2018. Hmm. So your site must work on mobile devices. It must work equally to the desktop site. A couple of ways of doing this. You can have a separate mobile site. You can have two domains. You can have a www dot and an m dot. Who remembers WML? Yeah, that was a bad idea, wasn't it? I think this kind of feels a bit WML. So you have two sets of templates, and there's two places to get things wrong, and then you redirect as appropriate. You detect the browser, perhaps. And you have an increased maintenance mode, because you've got two sets of templates. Um, or you can trust the user. You can say, the user knows which site they want. Um, if they want the M dot version, then we serve them the M dot version, and we don't care what browser that they're, that they're, they're, they're asking for. Um, that has a problem when I'm using on my desktop and my friend has shared us a, a URL from, the, from their phone and I end up viewing the mobile version on my desktop and it looks horrible. Um, browser sniffing, these are like the mobile user agent to the mobile site and the desktop user agent to the desktop site. Maybe with an override click to say, no, I really want to see the desktop site where the tablets fit in and that. It's a nightmare, it's horrible. Uh, it's what Zupra does. Or you can have a responsive page. Because we have this thing in CSS3 called Ridley Theory that may be able to change the layout of your website and reflow the website as um, the window size changes, the menu becomes like a little burger menu, for example. Hard to get it right, um, but you make the things sit on a single domain and everything just works. And there's a thing called Big Fat, which is a CSS framework from Twitter, it has responsive classes built in. Easier to get the responsive layouts working. Uh, not easy, easier. Um, I recommend you just use it because it just makes your life easier. Um, so here's a, a website that I built last year. This is the desktop version. Um, so you've got um, a sidebar here, you've got a menu up the top here. To make it a bit narrower, um, the sidebar just goes down underneath. That's so that's a tablet perhaps, and we make it even narrower this is the phone. See that the sidebar is still under here, but the menu bar has turned into a burger. And I didn't like any of that code, it just, it just works because it's a bootstrap site. Bootstrap is awesome. I have three minutes. Seven major mobile pages. It's a Google Day initiative. Uh, this is talking about mobile not so much from the point of view of the size of the screen, but from the, um, uh, the way that the network, the network is often cracked when you're on a uh, Mobile page, so it's optimizing the pages for mobile devices. You can go there and find out more about it. Um, it's basically three bits to it. You um, change the HTML, you add in uh, an AMP JavaScript library, and you um, do some caching. No time to go into that in more detail. <coughs> Measurement, measuring the set, yeah, you can't improve stuff unless you measure it. Um, so Google gives you some free tools for doing that. Uh, you should all be using Google Analytics, but there's also the Google Webmaster tools. Uh, Google Analytics, you just stick some JavaScript on your page, and then you get a ridiculous amount of information about the visitors and what pages they go to and all that kind of stuff. All sites should use it, uh, yeah, assuming that you trust Google with all that data, which some people might not. Uh, Google Webmaster tools, you validate the, your ownership of a domain by adding a DNS setting, and then you get data about Google's index of your site. And you get any HTML errors that are on your site, not validation errors, but like duplicate content and, and that kind of thing. So you recall stats, how many of your pages are being crawled, 
crawl errors, four and fours that it's found on your site gives you lots of information about so how you can get to um, fix things. Um, and there are also page tools to get. I mean, you can go an awful long way with Google Webmaster Tools and Google Analytics, um, but there are far more detailed reports from um, companies like Milk and Sandwich, and most of them will have uh, free trial months so you can give your stuff a go, etc. Right, conclusion. <coughs> step one, improve on page SEO. Step two, mumble. Step three, copy. By getting Google to understand your, your site, therefore Google pushes your site up the rankings, therefore you get more visitors, therefore you make more money. Thank you to the sponsors. I have approximately zero minutes for questions. Uh, and it's not copy paste, I was wrong, I apologise. Thank you for listening, I hope it was useful. Please, um, I, don't, I don't have time for questions, but I'm sure this gentleman would like to set up for his talk. Um, and, but I'm around, so please stop me in the corridor and ask any questions that you might have. And um, please feedback to my by email. I should do anything differently when I'm giving a much longer version of this talk from Glasgow next year. Thank you very much.